Welcome to our video, Crosswind Landings Essentials, sponsored by Avemco Insurance Company. My name is Gene Benson. A significant number of incidents and accidents happen during the execution of a crosswind landing, so let's take a brief look at how we might be able to avoid that. Before we begin our discussion of crosswind landings, let's return to our pre-flight preparation. We should have a good idea of what to expect at any of our possible landing runways regarding the crosswind component. The wind will probably not be exactly what was forecast, but we should be able to identify dangerous or marginal conditions before we depart. We are all familiar with this crosswind component chart. For a rule of thumb without the chart, we can come close. If the wind differs from the runway heading by 15 degrees, the crosswind component is one quarter or 25% of the wind velocity. If the difference between the wind and the runway is 30 degrees, the crosswind is half of the reported wind speed. If the wind makes a 45 degree angle with the runway, the crosswind component is three quarters or 75% of the overall wind speed. And when the windsock is pointing 60 degrees or more from the runway center line, we just assume that the crosswind is the same as the total wind. It's pretty close and you'd only be overestimating the crosswind component, which is probably not a bad idea. The greater the angle, the more dangerous the gusts. Many crosswind landing incidents and accidents result from encountering gusts during a crosswind landing attempt. Here are a few tips on handling gusty winds on the landing approach. Maintain a firm grip on the yoke with feet solidly on the rudder pedals. You fly the airplane, don't let the airplane fly you. Be ready to react, but don't overreact. Don't apply ailerons without applying compensating rudder in the same direction. What about the maximum demonstrated crosswind component? To be certified, an airplane must be satisfactorily controllable with no exceptional degree of skill or alertness on the part of the pilot in 90 degree crosswinds up to a velocity equal to 0.2 VSO. Often the demonstrated crosswind component is greater than the minimum required. It is not a regulatory requirement under Part 91. But remember, you are a test pilot if you operate beyond the demonstrated crosswind component. However, the maximum for the airplane might not be the maximum for the pilot. We must be honest with ourselves about our proficiency in handling a crosswind. How long has it been since we tackled a stiff or gusty crosswind? Let's look at the mechanics of a crosswind landing. The runway center line can be tracked by establishing a wind correction or crab angle. This is exactly what we do on a cross-country flight to maintain a desired ground track. Some pilots advocate maintaining the crab until just before a touchdown and then kicking it out. The problem with that approach is that the timing must be precise, and if the conditions are at all gusty, some luck is also required. If we contact the runway in a crab angle, we can put significant side load on the landing gear. We'll come back to that shortly. The side slip can also be used to track the runway center line. Beware that the side slip will increase drag and therefore rate of descent. Some airplanes have a limitation as to how long a side slip may be held. This is usually associated with the design of the fuel system. But the side slip approach is generally preferred as the landing method. We simply keep the longitudinal axis of the airplane aligned with the runway center line by using the rudder and adjust for drift with the ailerons. The airplane touches down on one main wheel and then we place the other main wheel down. The best crosswind landings result from utilizing the crab approach until the airplane is on short final approach and then transitioning to the side slip. It is very important that the longitudinal axis of the airplane be aligned with the runway at touchdown. With a side load, the center of gravity continues moving in the same direction as the drift. This will cause the airplane to tip and swerve. That can set up the perfect storm for a runway excursion. The side load can also lead to a ground loop. So now we're on the ground, but it's not over yet. Once we're on the ground, we must maintain airplane control. We want to avoid the rollover in tricycle gear airplanes or the ground loop in any airplane, but more commonly in tail draggers. The cornering angle has much to do with this. Cornering angle is the angular difference between the heading of the tire and its path. Whenever a load-bearing tire's path and heading diverge, a side load is created. It is accompanied by tire distortion. As little as 10 degrees of cornering angle creates a side load equal to half the supported weight. For each high-wing tricycle-geared airplane, there is a cornering angle at which rollover is inevitable. 
Tail draggers are more susceptible to the ground loop, but it can happen in any airplane. The example shown here is not a runway excursion because the airplane did not leave the runway, but ground loops often end up beside the runway. In any case, we want to avoid landing with a side load on the landing gear. So in summary, we discussed the importance of checking present and forecast winds during our pre-flight preparation. We touched upon the demonstrated crosswind component and rules of thumb. We briefly discussed the mechanics involved in a crosswind landing. We looked at the causes of the ground loop and the dynamic rollover. And we saw some tips on handling gusts. Thanks for watching our video sponsored by Avemco Insurance. I'm Gene Benson, and I want to invite you to visit our website, VectorsForSafety.com, for much more aviation safety material. For easy access, just pause the video and scan the code. That's all for now. Thanks again for watching.